Okay, um, I'd like to welcome all of you here uh, this evening to this event we have here. Um, thank you for coming. Uh, the, this tonight's event is a debate put on uh, in conjunction with the Islamic Society and the Christian Union. Uh, the topic of the debate is Muhammad in the Bible. Um, I understand that it was initially meant to be was Jesus a Muslim, but this was changed um, a few days ago, so I apologize for uh, the inconvenience in that regard. Uh, my, my name is Kunle um, Oyataru. I'll be the moderator for this evening. Uh, I'm a student here in DCU. I'm doing a master's in mechanical and manufacturing engineering. Um, I would like to ask you at this point to please turn off your mobile phones if you have them on you, just so that we don't disturb the event this evening. I would also like to mention that uh, this debate will be recorded and that which, um, recordings might be used in public media on sites like YouTube uh, and the likes. So we have two speakers here this evening. Um, the first speaker is Zakir Hussain. He's speaking for the Islamic Society. Um, he has started uh, debating recently. Um, he has had many debates, including uh, one with James White. Um, and he is currently involved with the MDI in the UK. Uh, that stands for the Muslim Debate Initiative. Our second speaker, for the, speaking for the Christian Union, is uh, Mr. Sam Green. Um, he's from Australia. Uh, he studied chemical engineering and also theology. Uh, he currently works with the International Fellowship of Evangelical Students in Australia, and he's also involved in Christian and Muslim discussions. So um, I'd like to take you through the format for the evening. Uh, what's what's going to happen is that we're going to have a um, 25-minute presentation for each speaker to make the argument in regards to the topic. Um, after that, there will be a 10-minute um, opportunity for each speaker to give a response to uh, the other's presentation. And after that, we're going to have another five minutes to give a response to the response that was given. Um, after the time, we're going to have uh, time for questions. So we'll um, take on questions from you, the audience, at that stage. I'd like to give um, three questions to each speaker. And um, without further ado, I'd like to invite our first speaker, Mr. Zakir Hussain, to come up. Firstly, I'd like to greet everybody here with the greeting of all the prophets. The same greeting that Jesus Christ himself in Luke chapter 24, when he came up to meet his disciples, he said to them, peace be with you, with the shalom alaikum. Since we follow the last and final messenger, the prophet Muhammad, on whom be peace, we say the same thing but in the Arabic dialect. So peace be with everybody here and also the guidance of God. I'd also like to thank the organizers for inviting me here and also thank Samuel Green for participating in this dialogue with me. And I'd also like to thank everybody here for attending. Now the topic of tonight's discussion is whether Muhammad is foretold in the scriptures of the Jews and Christians. Before I make a positive case as to why the answer is yes to the question of whether Muhammad is foretold, I would firstly like to take a brief minute to explain why this topic is important. Now to Christians, fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies is the biggest proof that Jesus is a true prophet. In many ancient debates between Jews and Christians regarding the prophethood and messiahship of Jesus, the Christians would bring up pro fulfillment of prophecies as a reason for the Jews to accept Jesus. Now in the same way, if Muslims can demonstrate that Muhammad is foretold in the scriptures of the Jews and Christians, then this too would be the biggest proof of his prophethood, and thus Christians should accept him. In fact, this is one of the proofs that the Quran itself lays out in Surah 7.157. I quote the following, Those who follow the apostle, the unlettered prophet, whom they find mentioned in their own scriptures, in the law and the gospel. So the Quran here is claiming that Muhammad is foretold in the previous scriptures. Now the methodology I will be using to establish my case is the very same methodology that Christians themselves use when finding prophecies of Jesus. I often find that Christians use a, concord a concordance approach for prophecies of Jesus but a conflict approach for prophecies of Muhammad. I am confident that if Christians, if they were to apply their own methodology to Muhammad then indeed they would confirm that he is foretold. Let me give you an example of the methodology used by Christians to find the prophecy of Jesus. In Matthew chapter 2, verse number 14, it reads in the following way. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. 
And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I call my son. So according to the Gospel of Matthew, there's a a prophecy in the Old Testament that Jesus fulfilled, which says, Out of Egypt I have called my son. But when when one goes back to the book of Hosea, where the statement is found, one will see that Matthew quoted half the sentence, and when read in full, it reads in the following way, When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. So we see that rather than being a prophecy of Jesus, this verse was in fact speaking about a past event, the Jewish exodus from Egypt at the time of Moses. Now Christians have two choices, either admit that Matthew ripped the Old Testament out of context, or say that scripture can have apparent meanings, but also be foreshadowing future events. If the, if the Christian chooses the latter option, then he must be consistent when analysing the case of Muhammad fulfilling prophecies. With this in mind, I will proceed with my positive case. The first prophecy is in the book of Genesis. In Genesis chapter 12, verse number 2, God says to Abraham, I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. In Genesis chapter 17, verse number 20, God repeats the same promise to Ishmael. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. I will bless him and make him fruitful and exceedingly numerous. He shall be the father of twelve princes, and I will make him a great nation. How was this great nation promise fulfilled? A Christian apologist by the name of Dr. Anisha Rosh, he writes in his book, Islam Revealed, page 208, I will make him a great nation, was fulfilled when the Muslim empire was a reality from the 7th to the 12th centuries. Let's see what the Arabs themselves have got to say. This is um, a narration of Jafar radiallahu anhu, who was a, a cousin of the Prophet, peace be upon him, when he immigrated to another country, which is modern day Ethiopia. This is what he said to the king O king, we were a people in a state of ignorance and immorality, worshipping idols and eating the flesh of dead animals, committing all sorts of abomination and shameful deeds, breaking the ties of kinship, treating guests badly and the strong among us exploited the weak. We remained in this state until Allah sent us a prophet, one from our own people whose lineage, truthfulness, trustworthiness and integrity were well known to us. This is what Sibius, a bishop in Syria, this is one of the earliest non-Muslim accounts we have of um, somebody acknowledged that a prophet had arise in the 7th century. This was um, dated to 660, about 30 years after the prophet died. This is a Christian, by the way. This is what he says about this. At that time, a certain man from along those same sons of Ishmael, whose name was Mahmud, Muhammad, a merchant, as if by God's command, appeared to them as a preacher and a path of truth. He taught them to recognize the God of Abraham, especially because he was learned and informed in the history of Moses. Now, because the command was from on high, at a single order, they all came together in unity of religion. Abandoning their vain cults, they turned to the living God who had appeared to their father, Abraham. This is what the Jewish rabbis behind the stone edition, Kumash commentary, admit on page 76. We see from the prophecy in this verse that 2,337 years elapsed before the Arabs, Ishmael's descendants, became a great nation with the rise of Islam in the 7th century. So, God made a promise to Abraham, which he also repeated to Hagar, Ishmael's mother, and he also repeated to Ishmael, and I've quoted the Arabs themselves, I've quoted Christians, I've quoted Jews, who all acknowledged that the fulfillment of this was the uh, prophethood of Muhammad and whom be peace. The second prophecy I'd like to talk about is Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse number 15 to 18. It reads in the following way. I'll just read the last um, um, verse number 18 to save time. I will, raise for, uh, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their kinsmen. I will put my words into his mouth. He shall tell them all that I command him. Now, Reverend James L. Dow at the Colin James Dictionary of the Bible under Moses on page 402 to 403, after talking about Moses, this is what he says, The only man in history who can be compared to him is Muhammad. This is a Christian, a reverend. In the weekly Time magazine, uh, news magazine Time, dated July 15, 1974, they looked at 
um, history's greatest leaders, after setting the criteria, this is what they said. Perhaps the greatest leader of all times was Muhammad, who combined all three functions. To a lesser degree, Moses did the same. The Encyclopedia of Religion under Islam, they write, Moses is highly regarded in Islam as the great prophet who foretold the coming of Muhammad, his successor. There is much in the life of Muhammad that is implicitly reminiscent of the Moses tradition. And finally, the Quran says in Surah 73, Ayah 15, Verily we have sent to you a messenger who is a witness over you, even as we sent a messenger to Pharaoh. And we all know who came to Pharaoh. The next part of the prophecy says, From among their kinsmen. Now, what do terms like kinsmen and brethren mean? Firstly, the Hebrew word translated as brethren or uh, uh, kinsmen is ach, which can mean brother, brother the same parents, half-brother, relative, kinship, etc. Now, Abraham had two sons. Well, he had more sons, but I'll, I'll leave it to these two for now. Ishmael is the fa- uh, father of the Ishmaelites. Isaac is the father of the Edomites and the Israelites. In Genesis chapter 16, verse number 12, it talks about Ishmael dwelling in the presence of his kinsmen, which are the other sons of Abraham. And according to Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse number 4, the Edomites are called the brethren of the Israelites. Why? Because they both trace themselves to Isaac. So in the same way, the Ishmaelites are the brethren of the Israelites because they both trace themselves to Abraham. Especially with Genesis chapter 17, verse number 5, where it says that Abraham will be the father of many nations. And the next part of the prophecy says, I will put my words in his mouth. Now every prophet speaks in the name of God and God's words, but the Quran is the only scripture which is the literal words of God from start to finish in every single mode of recitation. And the next part says, And he shall speak all that I command him, Muhammad, on, who, um, who be, uh, on whom be peace, spoke everything Allah commanded him and successfully completed his mission. As Surah Maida, chapter 5, verse number 3 says, This day have I perfected your religion for you, completed my favor upon you, and have chosen for you Islam as your religion. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 34, verse number 10, it says, Never again has there arisen in Israel a prophet like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. In another version of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, it reads in the following way, And there arose no more in Israel a prophet like Moses. In the Samaritan text, another version of the Old Testament, it reads, And there shall never arise in Israel a prophet like Moses, whom the Lord had spoken to. Now if Moses wrote these words, then that excludes every other prophet arising after him from among the Israelites of being a prophet like him, because it would not make sense if Moses in his own time is comparing himself to prophets who ain't come to exist yet. That's exactly what the Kamash commentary, a well-respected Jewish Orthodox commentary mentions on page 187. The sages note the Torah statement here that in Israel there would never be a prophet like Moses implies that among the non-Jewish nations, there could be such a prophet, and they cite Balaam as an example, which they believe is a prophet. Now, in John chapter 1, verse number 19 to 25, in the New Testament, we realize that they're still waiting for this prophet like Moses. John the Baptist is asked three questions. Is he Elijah? Is he the Messiah? Or is he the prophet? Notice it doesn't say a prophet, it says the prophet, a specific prophet. Christians claim, as Jesus said in the Gospel of Matthew, that um, John the Baptist is the spirit of Elijah. We know Jesus is the Christ, so who is the prophet? It's clear from here that the Messiah and the prophet are two separate figures. Also in John chapter 7, verse number 40 to to 52, people are debating, Jews are debating over who Jesus is. Some said this man is the prophet, others said he is the Messiah. Thus the people were divided because of Jesus. So they weren't arguing whether Jesus is God or not. They were arguing whether he's the prophet like Moses or whether he is the Messiah. Thus establishing once again that they recognize these as two separate figures. So that brings me to my third prophecy now. The paraclete or King James lovers will know him as the comforter. In 1 John chapter 2 verse number 1 it reads as the following. My dear children... I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have a comforter with the Father, 
Jesus Christ, the righteous one. In John chapter 14, verse number 16, Jesus says the following, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another comforter to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. What was Jesus? Jesus was a man and a prophet. Even Christians recognize that. So the other comforter is also a man and a prophet. Because you, in the Greek, the word used is alos, which means one of the same kind. In Greek, they have two words, alos or heteros. If the word heteros is used, it's another of the same. Uh, it's a, another one of us. Um, it's not of the same kind. For example, if I say, use the word heteros for Mercedes, and I will give you a heteros car, that means not another Mercedes, but another car, maybe a Toyota or something. But if I say alos, that means I will get you another Mercedes. So when Jesus said another comforter, he meant another one like him. And since he was a man and a prophet, the other comforter will also be a man and a prophet, unless it can be proven that Jesus is God. John chapter 16, verse number 7, up until 14, Jesus says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the paraclete will not come to you, but if I depart, I will send him to you, and when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin, and of righteousness, and of judgment. I have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. How be it, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak on his own authority, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Now what I've highlighted in blue, if you read that carefully, that fits the description of Deuteronomy chapter 18. For he shall not speak on his own authority, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. Remember Deuteronomy? He shall speak all that I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak all that I command him. And it says, and he will show you things to come. And we know the prophet of Deuteronomy will give prophecies, because the test of prophecy is given straight after. Now Christians maintain that this is talking about the Holy Spirit. But according to the Gospels themselves, the Holy Spirit was still present. As in Luke chapter 1, verse 41. Luke chapter 1, verse 67. And John chapter 20, verse 22, the disciples received it from Jesus. So if the disciples received the Holy Spirit while Jesus was still with them, then how can the Comforter be the one to come when Jesus leaves, if they received it while he was still with them? Which makes me move on to 7th century Arabia now. I won't have enough time to go into many of the narrations of Jews and Christians in the 7th century who were waiting for the Prophet, but I will mention one person by the name of Abdullah bin Salam, may Allah be pleased with him, which he says, When I heard about the Apostle, I knew by his descriptions, name, and the time at which he appeared, that he was the one we were waiting for. And when asked by his aunt about this prophet, um, is he the one we've been waiting for? He replies, um, I said, he is the brother of Moses and follows his religion, being sent with the same mission. He also says, I recognized him as soon as I seen him. How did they know? How did they know his physical description and his name? And his genealogy, I might not get time to talk about his genealogy and um, too much about his personality, but I'll try to fit that in if, if I get a few spare minutes. But how did they know his physical description? In the Song of Solomon, it reads as the following, My beloved is white and red, the chiefest amongst 10,000. His head is as the most fine gold, his locks are, black, uh, are wavy and black as a raven. By coincidence, the word that is translated as raven can also be translated as Arab. It depends on how you pronounce it and put the vowels. After giving all these um, other descriptions, talking about how nice this person is, it says in verse number 16, His mouth is most sweet, yet he is wholly desirable. This is my beloved, this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. Now one of the titles of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in Islamic sources is Habibullah, which means beloved of Allah. In um, Hadith number 6 of Shema'il al-Tirmidhi, it mentions that the Prophet, peace be upon him, skin color was white and red. If you go to any biography of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, on Who Be Peace, you will know that when he opened up Makkah um, towards the end of his life, he reached there with 10,000 companions, which fits the passage where it says, he is the chief amongst 10,000. His hair is black and wavy. In the same hadith narrated earlier, hadith number 6, Shamal Tirmidhi, we know that his hair was 
neither very curly nor very straight but had a slight wave in it and the Prophet peace be upon him was an Arab which is everybody must know anyway now by coincidence the word that translated as he is wholly desirable in the Hebrew it reads the following way Hikko mamintakim vikullu muhammadim in Hebrew the suffix plural im is added as a plural of attributes even the name of God in um, the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, it has this im at the end of it to talk about his majesty. Sometimes it's in the singular, sometimes it has the plural of attributes it's called. So it can read, his might is most sweet, yeah he is Muhammad. As this commentary, um, Trempa Longman third commentary, he says the word desirable, and in brackets, Muhammadim, derives from the root hamd. It's the same in the Arabic. Um, Hebrew and Arabic are sister languages. But the description doesn't finish there because this particular part in Song of Songs, the Jewish Study Bible confirms Song of Songs is not one big poem, it's a collection of poems put together. This one finishes in chapter 6, verse number 3, before it goes into the chorus, where after giving a description, the, <coughs> the lover is asked, Where is your lover so that we can help you find him? And the lady replies, My lover has gone to his garden where the balsam trees grow. Now, there are many interpretations to this passage and all that. Some Jews interpreted it in a sexual way. Some uh, Christians interpreted it as Christ's love um, for his church, etc. But by coincidence, Makkah is famous for balsam trees. Um, as these sources here, the Catholic Encyclopedia confirms. And also, this um, archaeological um, company in Israel, uh, Barilan University, confirmed that it was called the balsam of Mecca. So that's another coincidence. After giving a description of the Prophet, and his name being in the Hebrew text, a location comes, and it fits Mecca. <coughs> Even Psalms 84 confirms this, where it speaks about a valley of Bakr, and many translations of the Bible, I think even the Revised Standard Version of the Bible, translate the word Bakr as balsam trees. And Makkah is famous for balsam trees. And one of the names of Bakr, even in the Quran, I think is Surah 3, Ayah 96, off the top of my head, is Bakr. Because in Arabic, Bakr and Makkah um, are actually linguistically connected, um, if you connect the dialects. Also, Josephus, an ancient um, historian, Jewish historian, he mentions of an... Um, a narration of queen, the Queen of Sheba, she brought the root, the balsam root, from Arabia to King Solomon as a gift. So, my four, four points are the following. Prophet Muhammad and whom be peace was a fulfillment of God's promises to Abraham, Hagar and Ishmael. And um, some Christians believe that Ishmael was thrown out of the covenant, but for that topic, you can refer to my debate with David Wood on the covenant. It's on YouTube. And also, some Christians think that this is just a physical promise, just like numerous numbers. But if read in context, Abraham prayed to God, according to Genesis, that Ishmael may live before God, and God accepted that prayer. Even though some Bible translations say no, in the Hebrew it actually says yes. And um, so the great nation promise should be understood in the sense that the nation of Israel will live before God. The second one is that Prophet Muhammad on whom be peace is the prophet like Moses. Now we can, we can Samuel Green can quote the New Testament to say, oh, this makes him, uh, Jesus look like Moses, etc. I can quote Muslim sources that, oh, um, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is like Moses. But what I've done is I've quoted non-Muslim sources, Jews and Christians and historians and academics who have uh, recognized historically that Muhammad, peace be upon him, and Moses were very similar in history. Thirdly, the person that Jesus spoke about to come after him, who does not sound like a Holy Spirit who is 100% God, because he has to be told what to say, and God doesn't be told what to say. Um, this person sounds like the prophet like Moses. So if you connect the dots, um, this is another prophecy of Prophet Muhammad on whom be peace. And my fourth point was Prophet Muhammad on whom be peace was described in Song of Solomon. His name is there in the Hebrew, and a reference to Makkah is found in Song of Songs and when connected with Psalms 84, the Valley of Baca, where people do pilgrimage and that is very clear that this is a reference to Makkah so I'll leave it at that for now, thank you very much Welcome this evening and thanks for coming thank you that you uh, are concerned to deal with these issues and uh, to do so as Christians and Muslims coming together I think is a great thing 
I want to thank the Christian and Muslim societies at this university for putting on this event and working together for it. And um, I want to uh, thank Sakir for coming over from London for it as well. Now, you may be asking, why are we asking the question as to, is Muhammad foretold in the Bible? And as Zakia pointed out, the reason we're doing that is that it's actually a question that the Quran puts before us. Have a look at this first reference here. And when Jesus, son of Mary, said, Children of Israel, I am indeed the messenger of God to you, confirming the Torah that is before me and giving good tidings of a messenger who shall come after me, whose name shall be Ahmed. And then again, those who follow the messenger, the prophet, the Ummi, whom they find described in the Torah and the gospel, which are with them. And so these verses of the Quran, and particularly that last one, is talking about the Jews and the Christians, the books that they have, not other ones, it's quite clear, the books that are with them, that Muhammad is foretold in these books, that he's described in them. And, uh, and so this is part of the proof that the Quran gives. The Quran gives a whole range of proof as to why it is from God, and this is one element of the proof that the Quran gives. And I actually think that that's a great thing that it does. It just doesn't accept, uh, expect us to have blind faith. It says, here is some evidence, here is something for you to consider. And I want to start off by saying that if Muhammad is indeed foretold in the books of the, uh, in the Christian scriptures then Christians should accept him. But if he's not foretold, then we all should not accept Muhammad as a prophet because this is the very criteria that the Quran itself gives. And so what I want to do now is to to answer this question from the Christian perspective as to, is Muhammad foretold in the Bible? I just want to start off by explaining what the Bible is because not everybody is clear on that. Uh, The Bible is not just one book, but it's a collection of many books Uh, In fact, about uh, 66 or so different books over 1,500 years. It has the Torah, the books of the prophets, the Psalms and the Gospel. Christians believe all of the prophets and they make no distinction between them. And so we have all of them in our book, what we call the Bible. The Quran often refers to these books and and we've actually got copies of the Christian scriptures, of, of these books, from the time of Muhammad and before. Well, is Muhammad foretold in the Bible? I guess from the Christian perspective, we're used to the Gospels quoting parts of the earlier prophets and saying this is how Jesus fulfills them. And uh, indeed, Zakir pointed out some of that before. When we come to the Quran, it doesn't quote the earlier prophets like that. It may allude to their stories, but it never actually quotes a Gospel. It doesn't quote Deuteronomy. It doesn't quote those types of... Uh, th- those books. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to consider the scriptures that Muslim leaders often put forward and some of these were the ones that Zakir just uh, used uh, and mentioned just then. So let's look at the first of these in Deuteronomy 18. It says, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers and I will put my words in his mouth and he will tell them everything I command him. Now Muslim leaders tell us that this is speaking about M- Muhammad as the prophet like Moses. And they say, uh, as Zakir pointed out, that this is because Muhammad is from the Ishmaelites and the Ishmaelites were brothers to the Jews. I guess my first question there is, where does the Quran actually say that Muhammad was an Ishmaelite? I realise that we all may have that belief, but where does it say it? Because if it's such a, a crucial part to this argument, where is the Quranic verse specifying that? I want to put five reasons forward as to why Christians don't accept Muhammad as the prophet prophet mentioned here. The first is just the context itself. I've actually divided up the text of Deuteronomy chapter 17 and 18 for you there. And as you can see, it's not just talking about the prophet in Deuteronomy 18, but it's actually talking about other leaders, people who have different roles within within the society of Israel. And so you see there... There are the judges in chapter 17, verses 8 to 13. It talks about the kings in uh, 17, 14 to 20. And the kings have got to be from your brothers. It talks about the priests in chapter 18, verses 1 to 8, who have got to be from amongst your brothers, the right ones. And then it talks about the prophet. And so you can see, if we just look at the context of this, it's not actually just 
a random prophecy talking about uh, a, you know, just a prophet coming in the future. It's actually like a constitution of Israel that we're reading here. And it's setting forward the different roles that are going to exist within Israelite society. There's going to be judges, kings, priests and prophets. And so this verse, just in its context, is not talking about a prophet from somewhere else. That's just not the context. The context is the constitution, the setting up of Israel. And that these are all the leaders within Israel, and it's speaking about the judges, kings, priests, prophets in Israel, because that's just the context of what it's talking about. And just as with these others, when it talks about the king must be from your brothers, the priests are from your brothers and serve to your brothers, it's talking about Israelites. And so there's nothing at all from the context that would make you think it's referring to anybody outside of Israel, as the whole thing is all about the leaders within Israel. As we continue to read Deuteronomy 18, we actually see that uh, Muhammad doesn't fulfil it for, for other reasons as well. You'll notice in verse 20 it says, But a prophet who presumes to speak in my name anything I have not commanded him, or a prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, must be put to death. And so the prophet must not presume to speak. Yet what we actually find when we read the Islamic histories like Ibn Sa'd, one of the very early collections of Muhammad's life, and the history of Al-Tabari, one of the greatest Islamic scholars, we read these words of Muhammad in a very famous, a matawatir event of his life. Uh, it says that I ascribe to Allah what he had not said. And I have fabricated things against God and have imputed to him words which he had not spoken. Now, this is referring to a very well-documented event in Muhammad's life where he spoke words which were initially included in the Quran and then were later withdrawn. And you can see that this is, from the Christian perspective, we see him as speaking presumptuously here and so he does not fulfil the, uh, the, 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 the requirement of being a prophet like Moses. And I can, we can go through the, uh, what event that is. Also, if you want to be like Moses, you've got to agree with Moses. You've got to agree with Moses. And Moses, in the Torah column you can see there, taught that God made us in his image. Yet the Quran, we're not in the image of God, Surah 42 verse 11. In the Torah, God is Father, yet that's not one of the names of God in Islam. In the Torah, in the Exodus and in the Torah, there is the Son of God. Yet there, nobody can be called the Son of God in Surah 8, 5 verse 18. God dwells with his people in the Torah, but God does not dwell with his people in, in Islam. There's a substitute sacrifice for sin in the Torah, but not in Islam. And so you can see that that, uh, that, that you need to agree with Moses if you're going to, to, to be a prophet like Moses. You need to agree with him. And at almost every point, Muhammad doesn't agree with Moses. Now you may say, yes, but the key thing was that... Uh, Muhammad taught one God, and Moses taught one God. That is true, but so did Aristotle. Many people teach that there is one God. And if you look at that table I gave you there, you actually see that Muhammad's concept of the one God, where there's no image, no fatherhood, no son, uh, uh, those ideas, the Islamic concept of God is much closer to Aristotle than it is to the Torah, the Prophets, the Psalms and the Gospel. So if you want to be a prophet like Moses, you have to uh, agree with Moses just at the, the basic fundamentals. Also, I would like to quote uh, a Muslim here who actually says that Muhammad is not like Moses. I've, I read this book earlier last year. I try to read as many Islamic books as I can, and I read this one. And this Islamic scholar, Dr. Shawik uh, Abu Khalil, he gave, gives 12 reasons why Muhammad is not like Moses. He, and uh, he keeps, in, in, in his book, he ref, repeats this phrase, what a great difference there is between the two. He says, Muhammad, uh, Moses wanted to please God, but God wanted to, wants to please Muhammad. Moses had to ask for forgiveness, while Muhammad was given forgiveness without asking for it. Moses had to ask for confidence, but God gave Muhammad confidence without him asking. Moses had to ask God to ease his task, while God eased Muhammad's task without Muhammad asking. God spoke to Moses on earth, sorry, Moses spoke to God on earth, but, Moses, but Muhammad spoke to God in heaven. Moses was sent to the nation of Israel, but Muhammad was sent for all mankind. 
and Moses was, uh, was to be, uh, had to be brought under the loving eyes of God, but Muhammad is always under the loving eyes of God. Look, I, I won't go through all of them, but they, they continue to go through, and he keeps on repeating how different they are. And so this is just an Islamic scholar saying that Muhammad and Moses are quite different. And then finally, I, I would want to bring up that in the, in the Gospel, in the Mount of Transfiguration, we see Moses, Elijah and Jesus all there together. And so when the people are expecting the prophet like Moses and Elijah and the Christ to come, the Mount of Transfiguration is where you see all three of them. And what we're told is that Jesus is the prophet who is to come like Moses. It actually uh, quotes Deuteronomy 18 there of Jesus. And he is the prophet the same way that King David was the king and the prophet. And Moses was a king and a prophet. And in fact, as you go through the scriptures, you'll see that uh, the, the Messiah, when he comes, will be a king, a prophet, and a priest. I want to move on to... Uh, so, so just to conclude, Deuteronomy 18 uh, is, is not about Moses. Just read in its context, it's about the roles of, of, uh, the, people, of, of the leadership within Israel. I'd like to look at Song of Song now, and this is a, a popular one that I've seen uh, Muslims referring to. And uh, in particular, they'll refer to this verse where it says, His mouth is sweetness itself. He is altogether lovely, Mahmadim. This is my lover. This is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. And the claim here is that the Hebrew word for Mahmud in the singular, or Mahmadim, is about is Muhammad's name. And so Muhammad is specifically mentioned in this. And so this is a prophecy of him because his name is specifically mentioned. I guess... I want to explain now what, why Christians don't accept this. Firstly, we see this as a, a wedding song between a hus- uh, two people engaged, and so it's not particularly a prophecy for the future. It's a wedding song written in its context. But also there's something what's called the phonic fallacy. The phonic fallacy, and that is because one word in one language sounds similar to another word in another language, you can just transfer the meaning across. Now, I'm sure for most of you who know several languages... You can't just transfer meanings across like that, can you? So, for instance, the word Turkey. For Turkish people, Turkey means their people, their language, their culture. But in English, it means a, a bird. Now, you, you, you just can't transfer the meanings across. It, it just, it, it's ridiculous to do that. And so this word, Mahmadim, is certainly there in, in the Hebrew, but... You just can't go transferring it across. It's a Hebrew word which has its own Hebrew meaning. And I think part of the way that we can see that is to see how this exact same word is used elsewhere. And so I've got that up on the slide there for you. But about this time tomorrow, I'm going to send my officials to search your palace and the houses of your officials. They will seize everything of value of Mahmadim, of Mahmud, everything of value. See, it's everything of, of beauty, of what you love. It's your gold, your treasure. It's, it's that word. They're going to seize everything of value and carry it away. Now, it wouldn't make sense to say they're going to seize everything of Muhammad and carry it away. It's talking about the Babylonians coming to, uh, to the Jews and, and raiding their temple, raiding the, 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 their palace, sorry, raiding their palace. And you can see that, that there are a number of other references where that word is used, and it just means the things you love, the things you value. And so that's how the word is used in Hebrew. It is used in the plural, but it's not a plural of respect. It's a plural because the subject of the clause is plural, and so the predicate has to be plural. It's just grammatical as to why it's plural. So I want to say that uh, Song of Songs is not about Muhammad. It's just read in its own context. It's a normal Hebrew word. It's describing the passionate love that a man and woman have for each other before they get married. (coughs) I would like to now move on to John 14. This is the third made one that is used uh, by Muslims, and you'll find this in their, their literature. We see here, And I, Jesus, will ask the Father, and he will give you another counsellor to be with you forever. And this word, uh, counsellor there, paraclete, Muslim leaders will say to us, is a reference to Muhammad. Now, the reason why Christians don't accept this is, again, because we just want to read it in context. And again, with all of these things, 
I hope you, 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 you can understand the scriptures. See, one of the great things that we do in the, the Christian groups on campus is that we train people to read the Bible. That's part of what we do on campus. Teach people how to read in context, understand the Bible as a whole, so that you can read and understand the Bible. And you're always welcome to come along and, and learn how to read the scriptures that way. And so when we continue to read here, what do we see? This is where Jesus is speaking again on the paraclete, and he says, These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you, but the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things. And so Jesus actually says it's the Holy Spirit. He actually specifically says that. And when he describes him, it's not a description of a man. He says the world cannot see or know him. Well, the world could see Muhammad, couldn't it? The world saw Muhammad. He lives in his disciples. Now, Muhammad doesn't live in the disciples of Jesus. Remember, Jesus said the Spirit is going to come to his disciples at that time. When Jesus is saying the Spirit will come to you, he's saying to Peter, Paul, he's saying to you, to Peter, Peter, James and John, he's saying to you, the Spirit is coming to you. Now, if he was referring to a prophet coming in 600 years' time, he, he, he wouldn't say he's coming to you because he wasn't coming to them, was he? They'd, they'd be dead for 600 years. Amen. Well, sorry, there'll be question time. And also, in verse 26, we're told that the the Spirit is sent in Jesus' name. Now, Muhammad wasn't sent in Jesus' name. So again, I'm just asking you to read this in context. It actually says it's the Holy Spirit. And when we get to the the latter part of John's Gospel, we actually read near, near the end of it, Jesus has been promising the Holy Spirit, and we read, And with that, he breathed and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. And so the promise that he gives of of the Spirit coming is what they actually receive at the end of the Gospel. This is actually the fulfilment of what the prophet said would happen. So if, if you look at that second quote there, this is the prophet Ezekiel, hundreds of years before Jesus. I will put my Spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to observe my ordinances. You see, there was a promise in the prophets before Jesus that God would do this. And look at John the Baptist before Jesus. I, John, baptise with water, but he, Jesus, will baptise you with the Holy Spirit. See, this is the the big message throughout the the prophets, the Torah, the prophets, the Psalms and the Gospel, that God will give you your spirit. And I guess this is what I find frustrating with people saying that it's about Muhammad, because it's actually taking away from a great promise that God has for you. And that is, the promise that God has is that if you come to Jesus... If you believe on Jesus, as the scripture says, then he will give you the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will change your life. That's why we've got to get this straight. Because God has promised to give us his spirit to change us so that we can walk in his ways. And I want to testify that when I became a Christian, the Holy Spirit has changed my life. Made me think different, made me understand God different. The things that Jesus talks about here, about understanding and and knowing those things, are things that Christians themselves can testify to. So that's why we need to get this straight, because this is a promise that that is for us. This is a promise that's for us. I guess for me also, the other reason why I don't see Muhammad being foretold in the Bible is that some Muslims have actually rewritten the Gospel to make Jesus foretell the coming of Muhammad. Okay, so they've rewritten the gospel to do this. There's two of these gospels in particular, the gospel of Barnabas and the gospel according to Islam. Let me just read you from the gospel according to, uh, gospel according to Islam. This is what the author, the Muslim author says. The book before you is a gospel. It is written in the light of the revelation of God made to the prophet Muhammad. This outline is supplemented in this book by some background material derived mostly from the New Testament and sometimes transformed according to the Quranic revelation to form a gospel approximately the size of Mark. As we said earlier, this book is offered as a new gospel, a Muslim equivalent of and and alternative to the existing gospels. Now, this Muslim is very open about what he's done, isn't he? He's saying, I've taken the gospels, I've taken the Quran, and I've transformed the gospel according to the Quran. Now, to me, that's shameful. (coughs) If Muhammad was really foretold, you would not have to do that. Now, Christians have not had to rewrite the Torah, the prophets, and the Psalms to make them foretell Jesus. We just 
have them in our book and we just read them. We get them straight from the Jews. We haven't had to write new ones. And so for me, this is proof that, um, uh, that, that Muhammad is not foretold because if he was, you would not have to do this. I want to finish up now, though, by looking at a comparison. Because so, you need to understand how Christians feel as, as to why we don't understand Muhammad. So I want you to look at what Christians themselves have for Jesus. When Christians talk about prophecies being fulfilled, these are the types of things we're talking about. Now, this is from the prophet Isaiah, uh, around, um, around 700 years before Jesus. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and give birth to a son. Now, that's a pretty big promise, isn't it? That a virgin will have a son. We all know who fulfilled that. But that, that's quite clear, isn't it? But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, Although you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come one for me who will be the ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. <coughs> See, the, the Messiah is going to come from Bethlehem, and that's, that's where Jesus was born. In Isaiah again, we're told about when the, God's kingdom comes, it will come with these signs, it's going to bring this type of new life. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer, and the mute tongue shout for joy. And of course, these are exactly the type of miracles that Jesus did. <coughs> Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout, uh, daughter of Jerusalem. See your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And so Jesus, when he entered Jerusalem, didn't come as a conquering king, but, but came in, in this gentleness, riding on a donkey. We read about the new covenant that Jesus brought. Again, this is the prophet Jeremiah, around 600 years before Jesus. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And this is another one from Isaiah that I'd like you to, 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 to reflect on. Have a listen, listen to this. This is the servant of the Lord who's going to come and do God's work and save God's people. It says, He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds we are healed. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Now there's a whole chapter on this that I invite you to read. I've just shortened it down here. But you can see this is about somebody bearing the sins of somebody else like the sacrifices in the Old Testament, like the sacrifices in the Torah, which you could offer an animal as a sacrifice in place of your sin, this person is going to do this. And you see, after the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. That is, they're going to die and come back to life again. So this is a, quite a specific prophecy about somebody suffering on behalf of others and being raised from the dead. And again, this is 700 years before Jesus. And so, sorry, my notes have just got a little bit out of uh, line here. Now, for us, you need to understand that for us, th th this is very clear. We look at these and say, yes, we can see this. And remember those tables that I put up before where the idea of the image of God, it's in the Torah, the prophets, the Psalms, and the gospel. The fatherhood of God is in the Torah, the prophets, the Psalms, and the gospel. <coughs> The Son of God is in the Torah, the Prophets, the Psalms, and the Gospel. A sacrifice for sin is in the Torah, the Prophets, the Psalms, and the Gospel. And so we see these specific prophecies about Jesus, but we also see this broad confirmation with the coming of Jesus that holds all the Scriptures together. And this is why, as I said, Christians believe all the prophets and read them all and have all of them in their books. So to conclude, is Muhammad in the Bible? Is he foretold in the Bible? We would answer no. When we look at the, the references, read them in context, we would say he's not. We would in fact see that, that, that these claims have led some Muslims to even writing false gospels. But when we look at how Jesus is foretold, we can see how somebody really is foretold in the Bible. And it's, it's that testimony to the life of Jesus we see fulfilled in the scriptures that I, I call upon you to believe. Thank you very much. Hello once again, everybody. Do you know, um, I must say I'm absolutely shocked 
Because I thought that when Samuel was going to do this debate, he would have done his research. I know he's seen my debate with Dr. James White, and nearly 99.8% of what he said has been refuted already, and I wish I had made the time longer, but I can't. Um, now, remember what I said in my opening statement, that I expect the Christians to be consistent. I think um, Samuel has really, really... Um, put a huge hole in the credibility of Christianity tonight, which I'm going to explain. Remember I said that many Christians have a concordance approach to prophecies of Jesus and a conflict approach for prophecies of Muhammad. First, um, Samuel said that we must read things in context. And remember the example I gave of Hosea chapter 11, where Matthew chopped off the first half of the sentence. Sammy Green, could you tell us whether that was in context, please? When it says, in the original, when Israel was a child, out of Egypt I call my son, talking about the Exodus, when Matthew only mentions this was to fulfill, out of Egypt I call my son, was that in context? I have a book in my bag there called, You Take Jesus, I'll Take God, a book by a Jewish rabbi by the name of Samuel Levine, where he blows holes in the, into nearly every prophecy, that Samuel brought up for Jesus. I'll give you an example. Samuel brought up the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 7, which says, The virgin shall give birth to um, a son whose name shall be Emmanuel. First point, um, I'll tie this in with what Samuel said about the paraclete. Samuel said that this was promised to the disciples, not somebody 600 years later. Thank you, Samuel, for saying that. You've actually confirmed Jesus is not the prophet like Moses because that was pro a promise to Jews at that time, not to the Son of God coming 1,400 years later. So thank you for confirming from your own standards that Jesus is not the prophet like Moses. Also, Isaiah chapter 7 is assigned to King Ahaz who died 700 years before Jesus. And the prophecy also says, she, the mother of this child, will call him Emmanuel. Please show me in the New Testament where Mary called Jesus Emmanuel, or there's a false prophecy. Thank you very much. He mentioned Jesus riding on a donkey. But do you know, this is the biggest proof that the New Testament writers were searching for anything in the Old Testament to try to make Jesus the fulfillment of it. Why is my proof of that? Matthew actually made a big blunder on Zechariah chapter 9, verse number 9. Because anybody who reads the Hebrew and understands Hebrew, they will know this is talking about one donkey. But Matthew thought he was talking about two donkeys. So just to make this a fulfillment of Zechariah 9.9, Matthew had Jesus walking, um, riding into Jerusalem on two donkeys at the same time. And in fact, the New American Bible, because I've, I've read Samuel Green's um, site, 101 Contradictions in the Bible um, Answered, but um, the answers weren't satisfactory anyway. This is what the New American Bible says on Zechariah 9.9. Um, just one second please um, the ass and the colt are the same animal in the prophecy mentioned twice in different ways the common Hebrew literary device of poetic parallelism that Matthew takes them as two is one of the reasons why some scholars think that he was a Gentile Matthew was a Gentile rather than a Jew because Matthew didn't understand that this was talking about one it says, an awkward picture resulting from Matthew's misunderstanding of the prophecy. Can you like, imagine Jesus riding into Jerusalem on two donkeys at one time? What, a leg on each donkey? <laughs> then he said, oh, um, Jesus said that um, the Spirit will be in you. But Jesus also said to his disciples in the same speech, I am in you and you are in me. So if Samuel Green wants to take that literally, then he must take um, that the disciples were literally inside Jesus. Then he said, oh, this comforter will come in Jesus' name. But as the biblical scholar C.K. Barrett mentions, the phrase in my name could be understood as in my place. Also the good, uh, good speed, the Bible translate in this way. And he gives two examples. Mark chapter 14, Jesus says, in my name many shall come saying I am the Messiah. Do false messiahs come in the name of Jesus claiming to be him? Or do they come in the place of Jesus claiming to, um, that they're the Messiah? Also in Matthew chapter 10, verse 41, Jesus says, He who receives a prophet in the name of another prophet, or he who receives a good person in the name of a good person, now people receive prophets in the place of prophets, not in the name. Then um, Samuel Green actually um, proved my point in my opening statement. Jesus said, I must leave for the comforter to come. But Samuel himself mentioned that in John chapter 20, um, 20 verse 22, the disciples received the Holy Spirit. While Jesus was still there, 
So Jesus has to leave for the comforter to come, but they receive the comfort, uh, the spirit while he's still there. That's a contradiction. Also, Samuel mentions in the Paraclete sayings that Jesus says it's the Holy Spirit. But as the same scholar C.K. Barrett and Raymond Brown point out, that the original reading might be the Spirit, not the Holy Spirit. Even this old Syriac manuscript doesn't have the word holy in there. And Gary M. Burge, uh, in his commentary on the New International Version of the Bible, actually mentions that there's variant readings. Some say Spirit of Truth, some say just the Spirit. And according to the language of John, which I quoted in my opening statement, in the book of 1 John, the word prophet and spirit are synonymous. Then he talks about Song of Solomon, and he says, Oh, Muhammad's in other places, uh, the, the word. I even said the same thing to James White, and I challenged him, show me one place, because I've got the Hebrew here right with me, anywhere in the Bible where the word Muhammadim appears in the same form. They all got different vowels, Samuel, I'd love for you to check the Hebrew. So Song of Solomon is the only place where the name Muhammadim comes. And another thing about Song of Solomon is, in every other place where they claim the word Muhammad is found, if you translated it into a name, the sentence would not make sense. But in Song of Solomon it still makes sense. But I'll give a counter example to Samuel. In the Gospel of John, Jesus allegedly said, Before Abraham was, I am. Now Christians claim that's talking about um, Yahweh's name. But the word ego, Amy, appears all over the New Testament. Even Paul used the same word, I am. Even a blind person used the name, I am. So were they all claiming to be Yahweh, Samuel? And you said that you shouldn't take from our Hebrew to Arabic, even though the Semitic languages. Why do you take from the Hebrew to the Greek and claim that Jesus is using the same word that was used in Exodus? Then um, Samuel says, does the Quran say Muhammad is an Ishmaelite? For one, the Quran doesn't have to say it. We're not sola scriptura like Protestant Christians. The majority of Christians are not sola scriptura. Jews are not sola scripturas. But the Quran makes it clear that Muhammad is an Ishmaelite. Because in Surah 2, Abraham and Ishmael pray for a prophet to come from among their descendants. And Surah 9, Ayah 128 shows that Muhammad is the fulfillment of that. Which means Muhammad is the descendant of Ishmael. Samuel Green mentions that uh, Muhammad cannot be the prophet like Moses because it says, He who speaks in my name, why I have not commanded him, is not basically a true prophet and he shall die. Point number one, I'm not even going to say to Samuel Green that the story is false because he's going to say, oh, it's in the first 150 years of Islam, etc. But Islam has a real system. It can't just be early. It has to be reliable. But if Samuel Green accepts the first part of the story that Satan tricked Muhammad, um, to say those words, then I asked Samuel Green, does he accept the second part of the story that says God sent an angel to Muhammad and cancelled out what Satan did? So I'd love to uh, hear that. Also, um, Samuel Green has actually read this out of context. This is not talking about any words. This is talking about prophecies. The classical Christian scholar John Gills said this is talking about prophets who speak falsehood on purpose, intentionally in the name of God. Also, um, the Komash commentary, a Jewish commentary, says this is talking about a prophet that willfully speaks falsehood in the name of God. But the story Samuel cited, Muhammad didn't do it on purpose, Satan tricked him. But do you know this actual um, verse that Samuel Green tried to disprove the prophethood of Muhammad with actually works against the biblical Jesus. And now you're going to see Jesus, um, Samuel once again using the concordance approach for Jesus, but the conflict approach with Muhammad. This actual verse says, whoever speaks in my name false, he is not a prophet of God, in a nutshell. In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus, after speaking about the sun, and the stars falling down, and wars, and rumors of wars, Jesus tells his um, disciples, this generation shall not pass away till all these things happen. As C um, C.S. Lewis, one of the greatest Christian apologists of the last century, said, this is the most embarrassing verse of the Bible. One minute. Even the New American Bible, they say in the footnote that Matthew must have thought that this, um, that this was going to happen in his own generation. It's a false prophecy. Now we'll see how Samuel Green tries to um, flip it around. But according to the same verse that Samuel Green mentioned, Jesus is not the prophet like Moses. Then Samuel Green talks about the word brethren. But point number one is, the word brethren... It's in the context when you know it's Israelite. It's in the context when you know it's talking about another one. But Deuteronomy 18 verse 15 onwards is ambiguous. It's, it's ambiguous. You can interpret it as fellow Israelite and you can interpret it as other prophets. But I challenge Samuel Green to show how is Jesus a brethren of Moses. I'm, I'm sure you must have heard this argument. Jesus had no father. So he cannot trace his lineage to one of the twelve tribes. And to be a brethren of Moses, you have to trace your lineage to one of the twelve tribes. In fact, the Quran in Surah 61, ayah number 5 and ayah number 6 even makes this distinction. 
And the last point I'd like to um, handle before I go is Samuel said, um, some Muslims said that um, uh, Moses is not like um, Muhammad. But if you read the reference Samuel said, it only shows that Muhammad is greater than Moses. The book of Hebrews says the same thing about Jesus being like Moses. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you for, the, for that, Zakia. Oops, hang on, where's my watch? Let's get going. Thank you for that. And uh, I'll bring up some of the issues that you raised. First of all, you said that uh, I've got, uh, I'm, I'm hypocritical in my methodology because I'm applying one methodology for the fulfillment of prophecy for Jesus and another, uh, a critical one when it comes to Muhammad. But as I tried to show you and the examples I gave, they were of explicit ones of the blind seeing, of the deaf hearing, of the lame walking. They're fairly, you know, I'm not, I'm not pushing that example. It, it's, uh, you know, the virgin. Now, he was saying that, uh, well, I'll come to the, the virgin one later on. He particularly brought up Hosea 11, where it says, um, Out of Egypt I called my son. And, and when you read it, it's actually talking about Israel. Now, I fully agree with you there. And he said, you know, I'm, 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 uh, Matthew's ripped it off or it's foreshadowing. But there's actually another option. You put forward two options, but there's another one. And that is that Jesus fulfills the destiny of Israel. And this is actually one of the big themes in the prophet Isaiah. That, there is, there are, that Israel is the servant of God, but they've failed to be the servant that they were supposed to be. And so there is an, another servant, an individual, who is Israel, they're called Israel, and they're going to fulfill Israel's destiny. And so when Matthew is quoting this, he's actually quoting it brilliantly, because what he's showing is that the destiny that national Israel failed in, Jesus fulfills that destiny. And so when you read the beginning of Matthew's Gospel... Jesus' life parallels the life of Israel. He goes down to Egypt. He comes out of Egypt. All of those, uh, he goes into the desert for 40 days, like Israel was in the desert for 40 years. He quotes all the lessons that Israel was meant to learn in it. And so Jesus' life is paralleled to Israel. So that's how I'm quoting it. I'm not, I'm not misrepresenting it at all. I'm actually doing it. And this is why I want to encourage you to read all of the prophets, because if you read all of the prophets, you'll see how they hold together. Now, I want to look at uh, Genesis chapter 12, which was what he brought up in his presentation about uh, Muhammad. And he said, Muhammad, uh, uh, sorry, God made the promise to Abraham. And because he made this promise to Abraham, it comes to Ishmael. And he quoted uh, Genesis 17 about this promise. And I guess what I'd just like you to do is just to actually read Genesis 17. Because what it says is Abraham, so Genesis 17, verse 17, Abraham fell face down. He laughed and said to himself, will a son be born to a man a hundred years old? Will Sarah uh, bear a child at the age of 90? And Abraham said to God, if only Ishmael might live under your blessing. Then God said, yes, your wife Sarah will bear a son and you will call him Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. And as for Ishmael, I have heard you, I will surely bless him, and I will make him fruitful, and I will greatly increase his numbers. He will be a father of twelve tribes, and I will make him into a great nation, but my covenant I will establish with Isaac. So it's very specific. And all I'm asking you to do with these is to read these in context. To read them in context. He quoted from the Jewish, uh, from Jewish Christian scholars, and from Time Magazine, uh, Time Magazine, to prove the prophethood of God. But what I'm saying is, you need to quote Genesis 17 properly, because when you read it, it says the exact opposite of what you were saying. It says, "Yes, Ishmael will be blessed, but the covenant is going this way." And in fact, if you read the story throughout the throughout the prophets, it's always not the firstborn son who gets the birthright, but the secondborn. And it's not just with Ishmael, it's also with Isaac and, and others. And it's because it's God's choice, not man's choice, that's being demonstrated. We'll have a look at Deuteronomy 18. Now, uh, you were saying there that... I, I've already mentioned this. So I'll, I'll cover what I said in Deuteronomy 18 again. And that was that... Where are we? Here we are that we need to read Deuteronomy in context, that Deuteronomy is spelling out, the whole chapters form a big section. You know, you know, if you want to understand a story, you read the whole book and then you understand how the individual chapter functions in that book. 
Well, when you read Deuteronomy, it's, it is setting Israel up. It's establishing the nation of Israel. And Israel are going to have judges, they're going to have kings, they're going to have priests, they're going to have prophets. And when you read it in context, that's just what it's saying. It's talking about the judges, kings, priests and prophets of Israel. And that's what the word brother means throughout these sections. And I can't see how you can read it any other way. Now, you said that uh, at this point, you also said that all of the Quran is the word of God. Well, what about Surah 1? Because Surah 1 is a prayer to, to God. It doesn't begin by saying God says this. It's just a prayer. And it's very interesting that Abdullah ibn Masud, one of Muhammad's companions, didn't have this Surah in his collection of the Quran. And so it wasn't universally accepted as part of the Quran. This is, there are major textual variants with the early Qurans, which is why the Caliph Uthman burnt and standardised them to make one version. But in this case, there wasn't agreement as to what the Word of God was, and there, there are a whole range of textual variants, and Surah 1 is a, a contested uh, part of the Quran. Now, how is Jesus the, the prophet like Moses? You said... He, he doesn't even have a lineage into, into Israel. Well, yes, he does. It's called his mother. It's called Mary. She was, she was an Israelite. She, she's a Jewish. So he came into that nation. I mean, you're just wrong to say he doesn't have a lineage there. He does. He may not have that fatherhood lineage, but he's certainly born into that family. So he has a, a Jewish mother and he's born into that family. And, and that's the, the lineage he takes on. You mentioned uh, John chapter 1, where the Jews say to John the Baptist, are you Elijah, the Messiah, or the prophet? And you said, well, you see, they're expecting three figures, and so we are expecting three figures. Well, you've only actually quoted one part of the Bible there, because there are plenty of other parts you can quote where they say different things. So of Jesus, in Matthew chapter 16, we read verse 13, When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is, who say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah and still Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you? Who do you say I am? Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And so you you see, he's quoted one thing about the Jews were thinking this and therefore we're expecting three. But if you read elsewhere... They're expecting four, five. Like, what it actually shows was that they weren't sure what they were expecting. They knew that some, the, the, the Messiah was coming, that they were getting a new covenant, that there'd be a prophet like Elijah. But how all these things were being spelt together, there was no general consensus. So you cannot quote John chapter 1 and Elijah, Messiah and the, the, the prophet and say, this is what it is. Because as I said before, there are many references in the Old Testament to the Messiah being uh, a prophet and being a priest. Psalm 110 in particular talks about the Messiah when he comes, he's going to be a priest in the order of Melchizedek. And King David was a prophet and a king. And so you can't go just dividing them off and saying every role must be separate. Very often One person did several roles. And in fact, um, as you read through the prophets, this is what we find in Isaiah 10 and Zechariah chapter 2. Now, in Isaiah 7, I'll come back to the idea of uh, the, the, the born of the virgin, because Isaiah 7 is an interesting one. In Isaiah 7, it, it certainly does talk about the virgin being with child, as in Hezekiah's time, and I I admit that. But then what happens is, as you move along, you see that there's another child to come, and we read this in chapter 9 of Isaiah. So there's the child of... of, um, There is the child of Hezekiah's time, who will be the Emmanuel and God with us. But then what happens is, the book of... Like, if you want to understand it, Zechariah begins, uh, this prophecy that we're reading begins in chapter 7 and goes right through to chapter 11. And you need to read those four chapters because what you find is that Zechariah is having the judgment of God come upon him by the nations. God says, I'm going to give you a sign. But then he talks about the future restoration of God's kingdom. And so the sign, this is one of the big biblical exegesis things, the sign of the virgin giving birth with child has an immediate application. But then in Isaiah chapter 9, it means this. 
For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor and Mighty God, Everlasting Father and Prince of Peace. And this is a, a, a prophecy about the Messiah who will come to bring the restoration of God's kingdom, which is what all the rest of the prophecy goes to talk about. And so we're not taking it out of context at all, and that Jewish rabbi just hasn't understood those, how those four chapters fit together. Thank you very much. All right. First thing I'd like to mention, folks, Samuel Green said that some Muslims have wrote their own gospel and it's very shameless. Now, I'd like Samuel Green to be con uh, consistent and um, see if the New Testament is shameful. They wrote their own Torah. In Luke chapter 24, verse 46, it says, Speaking to his disciples on the night of his alleged resurrection, he said, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third, uh, third day. I would love Samuel Green to show me where this prophecy is in the Old Testament. John chapter 7, verse number 38, Jesus said, He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. I would like Samuel Green to show me where his scriptures have said this. If not, then will the New Testament be shameful like those Muslim writers who wrote their own gospel? Then, um, you see, um, remember I mentioned that Christians have a concordance approach to Jesus and a conflict approach to Muhammad. Now, Samuel Green, by essence, has admitted that Matthew chopped half the sentence of Hosea 11, but then Samuel Green gave a beautiful explanation of oh, how it's okay, you know, um, etc. You see the concordance approach, but I gave lines and lines of description of the prophet, his skin color, his hair is black and wavy, the word Arabs in the text, his chief amongst 10,000, his name's there in the Hebrew, balsam is a reference to Makkah, that's not good enough. Samuel Green still never answered my point, where he said that, um, the comforter was promised to the disciples, so it can't be Muhammad who came 600 years later. So will Samuel Green admit that Jesus cannot be the prophet like Moses, because it was promised to Jews 1400 years before Jesus. This is why some Jews claim that Joshua was the fulfillment of it. So I'd like Samuel Green to either take back his words that it can't be referring to Muhammad because he came 600 years later, or admit that Jesus is not the prophet like Moses. Then Samuel Green said, um, uh, Jesus' lineage to the 12 tribes was through his mother, uh, this and that. But you have to stick to the Bible. Numbers chapter 1, from verse 1 to verse number 19, says that the lineage is according to the Father's house. Then um, Samuel Green mentioned that uh, people were speculating in the New Testament. Some said Jesus is John the Baptist, so they didn't know. But the people in John chapter 1, who asked the three questions, they were sent from the Pharisees. The Pharisees were knowledgeable people. They weren't people who just walk and ran on the street. Um, as far as the covenant with Ishmael and Isaac and that, I can't um, justify responding to that in these five minutes. I'd love for everybody to type in Zakir Hussain versus David Wood uh, in YouTube. We've got a whole debate on this whole topic. Sammy Green still hasn't mentioned that if he accepts the first part of the satanic versus story that Muhammad got tricked by Satan and praised idols, does he accept the second part of the story that says that God sent an angel and um, cancelled out what um, Satan did? And will Samuel Green also admit that according to the same words that he tried to condemn Muhammad with, that he spoke falsely in the name of God, will he admit Jesus did the biggest false prophecy found in the Bible? As C.S. Lewis said, this is the most embarrassing verse in the Bible in, in Matthew chapter 24. Um, can Samuel Green still um, tell us like, once again that Jesus must leave for the Comforter to come, but according to John chapter 20, verse 22, they received the Spirit while Jesus was with them. Um, I'd also like Samuel Green to answer my point about Isaiah chapter 7. He quoted this in his opening statement as a prophecy of Jesus, but the prophecy says, She, the mother of Emmanuel, will call him Emmanuel. I would like Samuel Green to show us where Jesus was called Emmanuel. And also... Um, Samuel Green mentions that um, all the prophets um, call Jesus father, etc. And Muhammad contradicts that he can't be the prophet like Moses. But I think the Bible loses credibility on whether the prophets really called um, God father. In Mark chapter 3 verse 35 it says, For whosoever shall do the will of God, the same is my brother and my sister and my mother. But according to the same story, Matthew chapter 12 Verse number 50, it says, For whosoever shall do the will of my Father, which is in heaven. So in the earlier gospel, according to the majority of New Testament scholars, Mark is the first gospel and Matthew copied from it. Matthew chained the word God to Father. So if we could see on this occasion, there's numerous more examples of 
the gospel writers changing the word when the prophet says God to Father, then why should I trust that any prophet in the Bible called God Father? So you'll have to explain who gave right, uh, the right to Matthew to change the words of Jesus. I don't know why Samuel Green brought up the um, you know, Surah of Fatiha. First off, the first Surah, God doesn't have to say, oh, this is a prayer for you, lad. Muslims, with their common sense, no. God is teaching us how to pray to him. He doesn't have to tell us, oh, this is from God. And also, I don't know why you brought up Abdullah bin Masood with debating the Quran of the Bible on Monday. So I don't see the relevancy. He's just trying to shock people that the Quran hasn't been preserved. Because they got 5,000 manuscripts that don't agree with each other, he's trying to put us on the yeah, same boat. But Samuel Green, when it comes to preservation of scriptures, you're on the Titanic, we're on Noah's Ark. Okay, thank you for that, Zakia. Uh, he was referring to the Satanic Verses events, and, and this is a reference that, uh, as you see here by this Islamic scholar, the Satanic Verses incident is narrated in numerous reports between 18 to 25, depending on how they are reckoned, uh, uh, in independent Ruwaya, scattered amongst the Sirah Nabuwaya and Tafsal liter literature originating in the first two centuries, the indications are that it formed uh, the incident formed a fairly standard element of the historical memory of the early Muslim community. Now, with that many chains of narration, this is Matawatiya. It's across all the scholars, and it's that that Muhammad said that the pagan gods in Mecca, Alat, Uza, and Manat, that you could pray to them. So he compromised his monotheism. That's a significant thing. right? And that's why I brought it up with Deuteronomy 18. I'm not just throwing dust in the air. It's a significant thing. And this is well established. Now, many Muslims don't like it. They, they want to see Muhammad as maintaining monotheism all the time. But it's just not the case. This is, it's well accounted. And Islamic scholars of various degrees would still accept it today. Um, yes, the, I, I do accept that the account certainly says that the angel came and corrected him. But, okay, the angel comes and corrects him. I, the point is he still did it. And that's my point, that he still did it. And, uh, and as I pointed out to you, he said, I ascribed things to Allah he had not said, and I fabricated things against God, and have imputed words to him which he has not spoken. And I'm just simply saying that's significant. And uh, according to Deuteronomy 18, that means you're not a prophet like Moses. That's all I'm saying. Now, regarding Matthew 24, this is where Jesus is talking about the end of the world and the signs of the end of the age. And he says all of these things will happen. And he's saying, well, uh, Zakira said, well, by your own standard, Jesus is a false prophet because these things haven't happened. But I would say, no, they have happened. Because all of those things in the prophetic language that they use, the apocalyptic language, happened with, the, with Jesus' ascension to the, to, to the right hand of God. We see Jesus was raised from the dead ascended to God and he brought in the last age. And so those things, that whole age has begun with the disciples. And so that's why they began preaching the gospel and doing the things that they said they, they were. Now, you spoke about uh, where is the reference to Jesus being raised on the third day in the Old Testament. Well, again, this is where it's the whole book's picture because in the, in the books of the prophet, particularly Jonah, it's the third day and Jesus parallels himself to Jonah and the third day, he often compares himself to Jonah. So the third day could just be from Jonah there. But it's also, um, uh, he's, he's talking about, sorry, Jesus parallels himself and, and makes it the third day. But the third day is often used uh, a lot in the scriptures as things happen on the third day. When, when it's gone the third day, then you know it's truly been resolved. And so this, is, this phrase, the third day, is something that's often used. And you, if you type in and search the third day, you'll find these. So I, I don't have a conflict. Uh, I, it's not that I've got a concordance approach to the Bible. I'm just reading it all together. And this is because Christians read all the prophets. We actually read them all in our church. We don't try to turn people away from them. Now, you said that Jesus, uh, it's contradictory because Jesus said that the Spirit wouldn't come until he had left. The Spirit wouldn't come until he had left. And yet, we read at the end of John's Gospel that the Spirit came. And he's saying, well, that's a contradiction because he hasn't left. Yes, he has left because when he died, he rose again and ascended to the Father. So he had left. That's the leaving he's talking about. And then he came back to his disciples and appeared to them for, for 40 days. So please just read it because if you read John's Gospel, you'll see what the, the leaving and returning that he's talking about are. Uh, Jesus is certainly called Emmanuel in Matthew chapter 2. Thank you. And you said that in Matthew's Gospel it says Father and in, 
Uh, and in jo- Mark's Gospel, it doesn't say Father in a particular place. But that's because the Gospel accounts are based on eyewitnesses and they pick up different details at different times. And so the, and you, we actually have similar things within the Quran where it will talk about the same event and have different words at different times. So, for instance, uh, the angels who come to Mary, in one account, it's one angel, in another, it's two. And they say slightly different things for the same event. But I, I don't really bring that up because I think it's just different aspects being brought out at the same time. That's what we have for the Gospel. That there's no problem there. That's the nature of eyewitness accounts and how the same event can be reported slightly differently when different points are wanting to be made from it. Thank you very much. Um, now we're going to have time for questions. Um, I would like to give each speaker the same number of questions, so I would like to give each speaker three questions. Um, speakers will be given approximately three minutes to respond to the questions. I'd ask speakers to respect that time limit. And um, please, would you address these questions to me? I will relay that to the speakers, and they will answer your questions. So if you could have um, a question, go ahead, please. Well, uh, es- excuse me, sorry, who's this question for? Uh, in, in a way, for both speakers, the, there's, a, there's a, the, the point about the, about the, the uh, Lech, uh, Lech was abrupt to say uh, that this generation would not pass away uh, uh, until all these, uh, these things have happened. Uh, but the, the trouble is that the word generation represents the Greek word genea, which has more than one meaning, and it could simply mean that the Jewish race, uh, uh, not to, uh, the, uh, this race will not pass away until all these things have been fulfilled. So what exactly is your question? Uh, so uh, so uh, would, would either... Would either speaker have a, uh, have a response to that point? Okay, so I believe the question that was asked was that it was said that this generation will not pass until all these signs have been fulfilled. So would either speaker have a response to that? I'll just say something quickly. But, um, I think the gentleman's brought up a good point here that you need to read those things carefully and that's all I'm saying we need to do. I guess one of the difficulties here for you tonight may be versus being thrown up. And that can be pretty confusing, can't it? Right? And you, you, your head's buzzing and you're going, you know, what do I do with this? In the end, you've got to have taken some notes or email one of us and get our PowerPoint so you can go through it again. And then you consider the types of questions the, the gentleman's raised here that there are you know, other, ex- uh, other things you need to be thinking about. One thing I'd just like to say, and I thank you for your question, and that... Um, when I present an argument in an interfaith dialogue, I do not present arguments until I've read many Christian responses. I've got, my bookshelf is breaking apart with commentaries, I've got this size. The word genia, or genia, how you pronounce it, it means generation. Of every translation I've ever come across means translation. Even biblical scholars themselves say that those Christians who try to get out of the false prophecy, who try to say is raised, they're stretching the Greek. If Every time the word genia is used in the New Testament, it always means that generation at that time. If you want to claim it means the Jewish race, then Jesus also said, this generation shall not receive a sign. So if you want to say it's race, then that means this race will not see, receive a sign. That means Jesus won't have a second coming because that's a sign, isn't it? So if the Jews ain't going to have a sign, then that means Jesus... So it doesn't make sense. The New American Bible, they say, The difficulty raised by this verse cannot satisfactorily be removed by the supposition that this generation means the Jewish people throughout the course of their history, much less their entire race. Perhaps for, uh, perhaps for Matthew, it seems the ge- generation to which he, he and his community belonged... It's a false prophecy. So according to Deuteronomy 18, the test that Samuel himself brought up, Jesus is not the prophet like Moses. He's not even the prophet at all. Islam saves him. Okay. So can we have another question? So who's your question addressed to? Uh, Sanvi. Okay. okay. And your question is? Um, I have two questions. Okay. So just one question. Okay. Please. It's two and one, so. Um, <laughs> so you're saying that... Um, Christianity, you read all 
the books of all the prophets. But I wonder why some of the books of some of the prophets were left out when the, when the guys compiled the Bible together. And for example, the book of the of Enoch was left out. Although inside the book, and I read it myself, it prophesies that there will be a messenger, chosen one, will come after Jesus. The other one is, why would Jesus die for sins if he's God, if he's God himself? So can he not forgive rather than come and die for our sins? It's not like make him more human rather than God. Thank you. Okay, so I just translate that. So uh, the question that was asked is, why were certain uh, books left out of the Bible, like the Gospel of Enoch? Is that correct? And the second question, or part of the same question, was <laughs> why did Jesus come to die if he was God himself? Why couldn't he forgive sins on his own? Sure. So three minutes, please. Okay, so why were certain books left out of the Bible? Well, I guess both Muslims and Christians have had a time of forming their canon. And so there are certain books in the Bible. The one you referred to with Enoch was written and, and hasn't really been considered canonical by anybody. So just because a book existed doesn't automatically mean it was, uh, it's of the canon. And the early church fathers and the, uh, the, the, the Jews, they knew these prophets. The, the Christians knew Matthew. They knew the apostles. And it was through being able to have this authentication process that they uh, confirmed the books that were their scriptures. Now, exactly the same thing happened with the Quran. So that you, there are, as I said, some, surah, some Qurans didn't have the first surah or the last two. And some Qurans had 116 surahs. So Muslims had to go through a canonical process. We, we've both had to do it. I guess that's what I'm saying. We both have had to look at certain things and say, this is not authentic, that is. Muslims do it with Hadith, Muslims do it with the Quran. So there are some recitations of the Quran which are not acceptable because they've got a weak chain of narration. And so we, we have this authentication that we do. Now, have I got another three minutes there? No, you have one minute. One minute. Now, regarding Jesus dying for our sins, um, why did he have to do it? Well, basically what we see is that this is God's plan. This is the way that God chooses to show his glory. This is the way that God chooses to, to, to save us. And so in the Torah, we see that God sets up sacrifices for sin. And this is how God says, you know, sin brings death. This is how serious our sin is, that it brings death, and you need to learn this principle. And it's, from, it's that principle that goes through the Torah, the prophets, the Psalms, and the Gospel, and we see come to its fulfilment in Jesus. Okay, okay um, seeing as we've had two questions addressed to Mr. Green, could the next question be addressed to Mr. Hussain? Oh, sorry, Mr. Hussain. question for you. For myself. Okay. For myself. okay. <laughs> and your question is. I just want to ask you very quickly. Do you respect God? Just answer the questions. Yes. Do you respect God? Yes. Okay. Do you believe the Quran is the word of God? But at the same time, you don't believe the Bible is the word of God. The entire Bible. Sorry, excuse me. Can I, can I just stop this? One question. Could the question please be addressed yeah, as one? Just one minute. <laughs> Jesus declared in the Bible that it is the Son of God. And John 10, 30, he said, I and the Father are one. John chapter 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the same was in the beginning with God, and the same was God. All right, Genesis 1, God had created, and there was darkness upon the pavements of the heavens. The Holy Spirit moved them. Jesus was the Word that was spoken. And throughout the Bible, Jesus demonstrated the power of God. He healed the sick, he raised the dead, and he did all these miracles. Sia means a prophet. If Muhammad is a prophet, show me one miracle that Muhammad did in the Bible. In the Quran. Would you like to come up? All right. Um, just uh, what I can remember. I'll first um, answer John 1.1. 1, 1. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Was God. The yeah, same yeah. was in the beginning with God. All right. Um, I'll just answer earlier. You know, the, the second sentence says, and was with God. So which God was he with? So right. that sounds like there's more than one okay. God. Um, so can you please let him answer? John please. chapter 10, verse 30, when Jesus says, I and the Father are one. Read it in context. He's talking about purpose. But if you really want to believe that Jesus is God because of that verse, Jesus said in John chapter 17, verse 21, that him, his disciples, and God are one. So is there 15 gods in the Godhead? And also, um, you said um, if Muhammad is a true prophet, um, uh, which miracles did he do? But guess what? 
I don't. Yeah, I don't care whether Muhammad did miracles. I'm gonna say right now, just for the sake of argument, Muhammad did no miracle. Does that make him a false prophet? According to Jesus in Matthew 24, and according to Deuteronomy, false prophets, false Christ can do miracles. So if false pro um, prophets, false Christ can do miracles, why does Muhammad need to do a miracle to prove his prophethood? Because does it make all sense? the prophets in the, in the, in the Bible... Excuse me, sir. No, no, please, excuse me, sir. I'm just responding no, to No, that. you can respond after we're finished. We have a time session. We have to keep, keep in. Thank you for your response. Okay, so could we have the next question addressed to Mr. Green? Samuel Green? First, I'm just asking one, so I was going to ask the public about that. So I was going to say, do you think the biggest issue here is, is Muhammad predicted in the Bible? And this, and this is a very divergent issue for both sides of the path and the path. So I'm saying is, do you think that everyone who believes on one side is completely wrong and anyone who believes on the other side is completely wrong? Are faiths false? Or is one side completely right? Or is one side completely wrong? So the question is, is one faith wrong compared to another or all religions wrong? Based on this divergent issues we find here. Yes, well, as I began in my presentation, I quoted a series of verses in the Quran which actually put forward its authenticating principle in that the Quran just doesn't say you must believe. It actually puts forward certain proofs and says, here's the proof, go and check it out. And so what I've tried to do is to read, uh, it, it, the Quran itself doesn't give any references to where Muhammad's foretold in the, the Christian and Jewish scriptures. I've looked at the ones that Muslims bring up and I've taken you through them, read them in context, done all that. And so on that basis, I would say, yes, it is false because it act, the Quran itself is saying, Here's the proof, and if it's not, then it's false. And so I'm saying, well, I've looked at it, it's not, so by its own standard, it's, uh, it's disqualifying itself. So I would say yes. by your definition, all Muslims are wrong. That all Muslims are wrong? Yeah, yeah, I guess I'd be saying that. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. You need to qualify, like... <laughs> <laughs> it's not as simple as that because people aren't as simple as that and people are all over the place. So, you know what I mean? You, 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 you're getting a question, an answer out of me which is not really uh, the, the representative. But what I'm saying is that's the test the Quran gives and that's what I'm seeking to do. Yeah. I'm sure he said it's for both of us to question. But Thank you for that. Well, this is the question. This would be the last question to ask to Mr. Hussain. Uh, no, I'll uh, let someone else and ask a question. Okay. Thank sure. you. So, um, one more question for Mr. Hussain. Sorry, she had a hand up first. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, just before my question, a just short feedback. I guess you are trying also to convince everybody, which was a bit hard when you don't look at that part of the site. Sorry. But anyway, uh, so one of the arguments, which is that um, the, the Ismail is one of the, sorry, for you my English, that Mohammed <coughs> comes from Ismail and this is, this is, it's told in the Bible, it's told by the prophets, so it's true. And the Bible doesn't say that it's wrong, but then when came, when comes the idea of covenant with God, which basically this is true, that people, that the promises of God, of salvation of the world, is then how do you respond to that? How do you interpret this idea of covenants? And if you can look at us as we... Okay. So I believe her question was that um, if Muhammad is said to come from um, Ishmael, is that correct? Uh, could you please explain the promise of confidence given in the Bible? Yeah. Um, I'll look straight. <laughs> um, basically, um, so you want to know um, what the covenant means to us as Muslims, basically. Yeah, because this is what basically you don't really say. Yeah. I, I did a whole debate on the covenant. Um, it's, it's on YouTube where I go into a lot of detail. But basically, according to us Muslims, there was no such thing as Ishmael or Isaac. To us, it's Ishmael and Isaac. God blessed Abraham because Abraham passed the tests of God. He was faithful to God, so God told him from his progeny will all the prophets come. We do not believe Ishmael was cast out. 
And um, we believe that though God um, promised prophets to come through Isaac, God also promised a prophet to come through Ishmael. The things that happened with Isaac would happen through Ishmael. Ishmael, um, according to us, was a prophet. So when it comes to covenants and stuff, I don't think it's always the way it's portrayed in the Old Testament that uh, oh, Jacob got chosen and God hated Esau. Um, Isaac got chosen and um, Ishmael was a wild donkey of a man, etc. No, that wasn't the case because he... Huh. Bless him as well. Yeah, God, God blessed him. And many Christians try to respond by saying, oh, it's just physical blessings. But Abraham prayed, according to the Bible, for Ishmael to live before God. God accepted it according to the Bible and said he will make Ishmael a great nation, which means Ishmael and his nation will live before God. So that is a big proof that um, Ishmael was part of the covenant and the prophecies I've quoted in the Bible that are more clearer than the Jesus prophecies as tonight demonstrated um, point to the fact that Ishmael was part of the covenant. So thank you for the question. Um, thank you all for your questions. Sorry. Thank you all for your questions. I, um, I hope you can appreciate the fact that we don't have the time to... Um, consider all your questions this evening. I would uh, encourage you to meet the speakers afterwards if you have any pertaining uh, issues or questions with the presentations. Uh, but at this time, uh, we're going to give each speaker two minutes to summarize what their point was in the presentations given tonight. So, so, so. Would you like to... so two minutes, please. Uh, hello, everybody, once again. I'd just like to remind you of what my opening statement was. I first mentioned that um, Christians have a certain methodology that they use to try to prove to Jews that Jesus is the Messiah who was foretold in the Old Testament scriptures. I gave an example of Matthew chopping a sentence in half and saying that this is a fulfillment of prophecy. So what I tried to say is, is that if Christians have this methodology and a Muslim uses the same methodologies that the Gospel writers use to break a stronger case for the prophecies of Muhammad, and Christians should accept that Muhammad is foretold in the Bible. Many of the points, remember I said that Christians, they have a concordance approach for Jesus, like any little word here and there is a prophecy of Jesus, even if Matthew blunders it and makes Jesus ride into Jerusalem and two donkeys at one time um, is a prophecy of Jesus, that's okay. But the, the script, um, prophecies fulfilled that were promised to Abraham and Ishmael, that's not a prophecy of Muhammad. The description, uh, description in Song of Solomon um, that fits Muhammad to a T, his name's there in the Hebrew, that's not a prophecy of um, Muhammad. Jesus speaks about somebody to come after him who sounds like the prophet like Moses, that's not a prophecy like Muhammad. You see, um, there's two different approaches here, and many of the points that were raised against my case can actually go against the biblical case for Jesus, double. So I invite you lot to come back to the pure faith of the prophets, the true faith of Abraham, Ishmael, Isaac, and all Adam and all the prophets, that is Islam. The prophet came to restore the true teachings of the prof um, previous prophets and save you from the next life. So accept Islam and you will be saved, inshallah. Thank you very much. I want to thank you for coming tonight which, to, to do something which I think is, is quite difficult to do. It's not an easy thing to do, to do this. But I think it's very important for Christians and Muslims to be able to come together and to be able to be very clear as you know, to, to what we believe with each other and to put up our objections and to be able to talk these matters through. And so I want to thank uh, Zakir for coming over and that we can speak uh, frankly with each other this way. Uh, but I want to assure you that I have the greatest respect for him, and and uh, and uh, you know, even though we're challenging each other this way, it's only because we take these things seriously, and we've got to do it properly. Tonight, the question was: Is Muhammad foretold in the Bible? I considered Deuteronomy 18 and showed how it was speaking about the different roles within Israelite society, and is only talking about the Israelite prophets. We looked at the Song of Songs, and I showed how. It's, uh, it, it's a, a word that is commonly used, and I've given the references there. If, if you actually want any of the references, please just email me, and I will uh, send the, the PowerPoint to you. And then when we looked at John's Gospel about the coming of the Holy Spirit, we saw that it's the coming of the Holy Spirit, that this is what the prophets said would happen, that Jesus said it would happen, and, and then we actually see it recorded as happening. And so I, I find no grounds for Muhammad being foretold in the Bible at all.
In fact, as I pointed out, for some Muslims, it's even led them to write false gospels to foretell the coming of Muhammad because they can't find this evidence. I guess what I'd like to uh, finish up as well by saying, I want to call you back to all the prophets. The Bible has the Torah, the prophets, the Psalms and the gospel. Christians believe all the prophets. We make no distinction between them. And I want to invite you to not just read one prophet, but to read all of them because all of the prophets go together. And if we want to understand what God has said to us, we need to read all of these books. And uh, again, I ask you to, to, to consider all the prophets. Thank you very much. Uh, that's the end of our debate tonight. I would like to thank you all uh, very much for being able to make this here tonight. I'd like to thank both our speakers, Mr. Hussein and Mr. Green. Uh, I'd like to ask for you to give a round of applause to both of them. Um, Shall we just shake hands? Okay. <laughs> hey. Hey.